Good afternoon from Washington. I'm Andrew Tabler, the Martin J. Gross Senior Fellow here at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And I'm very happy to greet you today to our special anniversary policy forum, The Oil Weapon, What Power Do Energy Produ Exporters Wield in 2023? The October 1973 war was a seismic event in modern Middle East history, making the last major multi-state Arab-Israeli conflict the most significant use of oil boycotts for political purposes, the dawn of modern peacemaking, and America's emergence as the indispensable third party in peace diplomacy. To discuss the war's long-term impact and lessons for national security 50 years later, the Washington Institute is pleased to announce this third panel in a series of virtual anniversary events. First, joining us from North Carolina is Robert Bob, aka Bob McNally, who's the founder and president of Rapidan Energy Group, a Washington DC based independent energy market policy and geopolitical consulting firm. Bob's 32 year career includes service as a White, as a White House energy advisor to President George W. Bush, an oil market analyst and a hedge fund strategist at Tudor Investment Corporation. He is the author of the acclaimed book, Crude Volatility, the History and the Future of Boom-Bust Oil Prices from Columbia University. Thank you for joining us, Bob. Uh, second, we have Professor Brenda Schaefer. Brenda is an international energy specialist focusing on natural gas trade and foreign policy, politics, and energy in the Caspian region, energy security policies, European energy security, ethnic politics in Iran, critical energy infrastructure protection, policy analysis, and Eastern Mediterranean energy. She is a faculty member at the U.S. Post -Naval, Naval Postgraduate School, and Brenda recently published a book, Iran is More Than Persia, Ethnic Politics in Iran. Thank you very much for joining us, Brenda. And last but not least, we have Michael Ratner, who is a seasoned specialist in energy policy at the Congressional Research Service. His focus, um, of, or the focus of his work is global natural gas markets and geopolitics. Michael, thank you for joining us. After uh, Bob, Brenda, and Michael's presentations, we will then go to my colleague, Simon Henderson, who is beaming in today from London. Simon is the Baker Fellow and Director of the Bernstein Program on Golf and Energy Policy at the Washington Institute, specializing in energy matters and the Arab states of the Persian Gulf. So without further ado, um, just a few technical uh, details. To those of, those of you who are watching this today, if you would like to ask questions of our panelists during the event, please enter them into the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and they will pop up here and we will go to them a little bit later. And if you're watching this policy forum on our website or YouTube, feel free to email your questions to policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org, policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. Okay, Bob, over to you in North Carolina. Take it away. Andrew, thank you very much. Thank you for hosting. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be virtually uh, with friends, Brenda, Michael, and Simon, and you as well. And, uh, and Andrew, I'll see you in Oil City next week wearing your Drake Dialogue hat. I can't wait for that. It's, it's quite a historical moment uh, in the uh, history of energy in lots of ways. So um, look, I, I, I'd like to just make a, a few points putting the Arab oil embargo in 1973 into some historic context that's maybe a little different than the conventional depiction. And hopefully that'll shed a little bit of light on where we are and where we're going to. So uh, I asked and I was granted the right to show a few slides. So if I could ask Corey to put up uh, that, that deck that I brought with you, I'll try and make it as painless as possible, but you know what they say about pictures, uh, saying a thousand <laughs> words. So. I can't see it here, Andrew. So if you tell me uh, the one cover second. page is up, I'll believe you. There we go. All right. Okay, it's up. There we go. Um, okay, it, so there's the title slide. If we can go to the, the first slide, Corey, please. So when everybody talks about the Arab oil embargo of 1973, uh, it's as if you know, that's when the world changed. Uh, and this price chart, this is a monthly continuous crude oil price series I developed for the book going back to 1859, where it all began in Oil City. 
and Titus, uh, Titusville and so forth. And indeed, that line shows that a lot did change in, in 1973, uh, an explosion in volatility. And uh, in some ways, I find that, you know, folks say there's really nothing that could have possibly happened before the Arab oil embargo of October 1973 that really sheds light on why that volatility exploded and how the oil market works and so forth. And I think that's mistaken. I'm going to suggest there's actually another date that's almost equally as important as October of 1973 for how the world changed for oil. It was a year earlier, and I'll get to that in a second. So, but let's unpack and look a little bit before the Arab oil embargo of 1973. Next slide, please, Corey. <clears throat> okay, so what this shows you is if you look at prices, oil prices monthly, before uh, the Arab oil embargo, they alternate between multi-decade periods when oil prices are fairly stable, or when they are wildly volatile in what we call a boom-bust fashion. And what determined whether we were in a wildly volatile or a relatively stable multi-decade period was whether we had the presence of something that normally doesn't exist in the free market for oil, a supply regulator. Someone coming in and saying, you know what, this oil price is kind of on a roller coaster ride. It's the lifeblood of modern civilization since it transitioned from uh, illumination to transportation about 120 years ago. I can't have this volatility. So we're going to regulate it. There were three regulators for, for in history. Uh, Standard Oil, Mr. Rockefeller depicted there in the late 1800s. Uh, after and before Mr. Rockefeller, we had wild boom bust oil price volatility. And then, and folks forget this, from 1932 until 1972, and I'm giving you a hint on my alternative historical date that we should be celebrating or commemorating. <clears throat> From 1932 until 1972, the Texas Railroad Commission, Texas government regulators, were the OPEC of the world. Working with other oil states and the Seven Sisters, the major international oil companies, they controlled supply of oil so as to keep the price stable. OPEC took over from the Texas Railroad Commission in 1972, not 1973. Next uh, slide, please. Now, very quickly, just an economic point. Here's the difference between having a supply regulator and not for the price of oil. I measured volatility by looking at the percentage change over a given year, given my monthly series, min to max, and I averaged it. So this is just a, a little footnote on how important it is for stability in oil markets of having a swing producer or not. Uh, and I hope those numbers speak for themselves. I would just draw your attention to the Texas era when Texas, 1932 to 1972, was managing the oil market. We had the most stable period ever. Just keep that in mind. Next slide, please. Okay, we're going to go back to history now. So why do I say we why do I say we need a different date? Look, the Arab oil embargo coincided with a third third in a series of Arab-Israeli wars that led to a disruption in oil, right? We had the war initially after the uh, Declaration of Independence, but we had three wars that disrupted oil, uh, the 1956 war, the 1967 war, and the 1973 war. Now, <clears throat> we're going to talk about the first two in a second. Uh, we didn't see any disruption. We saw a disruption in oil, actually large ones, but no cataclysmic change in oil price volatility, right? What happened to, to make 1973 so special and transformative? Well, in March of 1972, something equally historic happened. The Texas Railroad Commission, three regulators, with the chairman, Mr. Byron Tunnel, uh, pictured there, the Texas Railroad Commission ordered the full production of Texas oil, no more holding back, no spare capacity anymore. And he called it a damned historic occasion, quote unquote. And he did that because he said he knew Texas, which had been the swing producer, the, the producer of last resort, the price stabilizer, was losing control. Demand was growing very fast in the United States. Supply was not. 
Texas lost all spare production capacity. And he handed over the keys of control to the oil market to OPEC. So when the third Arab-Israeli war came around and the third oil disruption came around, it became a big deal. The first two did not. And so we can go to the next slide to make this point a little more clearly. <clears throat> Pardon for the complexity, but if you bear with me, I think it really nicely brings together the importance of this swing producer role and why we talk about 73 and not 67 or 56. The um, gray bars uh, are physical disruptions in the crude oil market due to geopolitical events that are named, expressed in the left vertical axis as percent of total world oil market uh, supply. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, um, the orange line also expressed in terms of percent of total world supply is spare production capacity, right? When a swing producer, OPEC, Texas, orders wells to be shut in, you create this quickly producible spare production capacity that ordinarily doesn't exist. Okay. <clears throat> and then the black line is the price of oil. Please look at the bottom left-hand corner. Look at the 1956 Arab-Israeli war, I call it Suez Canal. It was actually in percentage terms, the largest oil disruption in history. Look at the price of oil. Did we see a massive oil price spike? Did, uh, did President Eisenhower go on TV or radio with a sweater and call for conservation? Did we have gas lines in the, in the 50s? No, why not? We had one third of the global oil supply base in spare, almost all of it in the United States. Texas dragged its heels. They didn't wanna go quickly, but eventually they increased production. Let's go to the next Arab-Israeli war, 1967. Another huge disruption in oil supply. Did President Johnson don the sweater? Did we have gas lines? Did we have mayhem? Do we, are we commemorating the, the Arab-Israeli war of 1967, the Six Day War as an oil market event? We are not, why? Because Texas Railroad Commission had plenty of oil in spare. Arab oil embargo in 1973, uh, the world changed. Why do we commemorate that? Because the year before that orange line shifted to Saudi Arabia and OPEC. And to paraphrase Mao Zedong, power in the global oil market flows through the barrel of spare production capacity. Next chart, please. <clears throat> Shameless plug for my book, which lays all this out. Uh, there's a picture of the Texas National Guard going into the fields to literally prod private sector drillers away from their wells just to impose control. I mean, the great irony of ironies is the Texans, uh, people put on earth by God to produce oil and limit government, resorted to the most heavy-handed government intervention that I'm aware of in almost any economic activity to keep oil prices stable. Point made, next slide, please. Okay, so now kind of where are we going? Where are we going? This is my kind of ending where are we going slide. This slide shows you that spare production capacity as a percent of total world supply. Again, just think a bit about the 50s. We had one third of the world's oil production in spare. Are you aware of any commodity, much less one as important as oil, where regulators will shut down one third of production to keep oil prices safe, especially free market oil producing loving Texans? I'm unaware of any. The point is, this line is controlled by OPEC after 1973. That's the important, it's actually 1972 actually, that's the importance of that era. And right now, as you, you see in the current period, we're quite low. Uh, it's a little bit high right now because Saudi Arabia has cut production, et cetera. But as we look forward, there's sort of two visions of the world. <clears throat> Many people think we're about to see peak demand for oil. And if that's the case, that's the light blue line, then Saudi Arabia and OPEC will probably be able to keep about 5% of the world in spare and probably manage the market pretty well. And we should look forward to relatively stable prices. A war, a recession will cause volatility. But um, we'll almost be grateful for OPEC because they play that price regulator role. I know that's controversial to say, but it's just what history shows. My view of the world is more like the black line, though. I don't believe in imminent peak demand. I don't think there's any evidence for that. I think we're going to be surprised at how thirsty the world is. And if that's the case, we're going to see OPEC or OPEC plus lose spare capacity in peacetime. That's what happened to Saudi Texas in 1972. That happened to Saudi Arabia in 2008. I think it's going to happen again. And again, we're going to find out the only thing worse than having someone stabilize the oil market is someone not stabilizing the oil market. And so that's really, I think, where we need to think about the importance of 1973, what it meant, what it didn't mean, 
in terms of oil market volatility and uh, and uh, and the and uh, geopolitics. With that, uh, thank you very much for your time. I look forward to the other comments and discussion. Fantastic, thanks, Bob. That was a great setup and a real tour de force. Um, and Brenda, um, with the, those comments in mind and your own, take it away. Um, thank you. Yes, actually, Bob's presentation was a perfect segue to the main points that I want to make that what's very unique about this current era of geopolitics of energy is actually the, the changing role of, of the United States. So throughout all those scenarios that Bob presented, we could talk about raised war, uh, role of OPEC or raised power, but the United States unquestionably on, on the highest levels, you know, generally from, you know, from the executive um, saw running uh, ener global energy security and clearly energy security for the United States and for US allies in Europe and in Asia as a, a primary national interest. And we've seen this throughout the 20th century through most of the beginning of the 21st century. Um, but from about the last four or five years, maybe starting a little earlier in Europe and, and, and starting in the United States with the Biden administration, we have a situation where um, the presumptions about geopolitics of energy, where, where energy needs are going, are, are in, and, and the role that the U.S. should play in that are completely different than everything we've seen in the past. So, for instance, we, ha we hear from our policymakers the, uh, the assumption that there is the energy transition, which is presented as if there's a train that's left the, left the station. And the question is, you know, when, are you, when is the United States going to get on that train? When is um, Tanzania going to get on that train? When is it various countries, but the energy transition is happening. But on the flip side, when we look at the data, there's absolutely no energy transition. We're not, you know, as Bob says, he doesn't, he doesn't expect, you know, peak, peak demand. We're 84% of world global energy consumption is from fossil fuels, 70% from the United States fossil fuels, with despite trillions of dollars and efforts and tax credits being thrown at that, those, those, those numbers are pretty, are pretty stubborn. And we don't see, you know, we don't see a ch change, change in that. Um, when we ask our policymakers about different questions of geopolitics of energy, different challenges, but we hear in both Europe and the United States is that renewables will solve everything. But of course, all of us know that one, we're not going to 100% renewal or a large portion of renewables. Again, the data doesn't show it. But at the second point, of course, renewables have a whole set of geopolitical challenges and our policymakers are not preparing for those geopolitical challenges. So, I mean, it's quite amazing if you look at the US last, last published national security uh, strategy, energy is mentioned 50 times and almost every time it's in the combination of clean energy, renewable energy, energy transition, there's no section on energy security and the national security strategy. All mentions of fossil fuels are in the negative, even though, again, US consumes 70% of its energy from uh, fossil fuels. The US military is highly dependent on you know, liquid uh, fossil, fossil fuels. And the US is the largest producer of oil and natural gas in the world. So you're saying what you do is that, and this, Actually, you know, a huge part of U.S. power is actually something negative that you want to get rid of. Um, even the 2022 national security strategy, uh, national defense strategy, relates to energy mostly in the context of renewable energy, low carbon energy reduction of energy. Um, it, it it mentions clean energy and climate more than it mentions operational energy, which is what the military should be thinking about. Operational energy is energy for the military's needs. So it doesn't have a section on that. Well, it does have sections on clean and renewable uh, n renewable energy. We know the famous um, cable that the White House sent to all the U.S. government, um, to all embassies and all agencies, October 2021, um, that essentially they cannot discuss fossil fuels, let alone fund them, um, you know, with any U.S. partners uh, globally or, or, you know, as, as, as the federal government. And recently we found out that even U.S., Officials, uh, employees are not supposed to attend conferences about fossil fuels um, you know, without special, you know, exceptional permission. So you're not supposed to even understand what's happening in these markets, in these in these um, areas of energy that, that again we use and we um, pr produce. Um, essentially, energy policy has turned to a subset of climate policy, and you would never see that in any other industry. For instance, in agriculture, there's just as many, you know, emissions as there is from, you know, in na natural gas. You would never, couldn't imagine the, the uh, an agriculture conference that is, is 80 or 90 percent of the panels are about 
how agriculture or food production affects climate or, or vice versa, right? But, it, but you rarely have any more energy conferences that aren't really about climate. Um, we also have a lot of assumptions in that, again, our policymakers are promoting, many of our journalists, think tankers, um, that somehow renewables can replace um, natural gas or whatever is used for, for baseload and electricity production. And as uh, our, our friend Michael Ratner has pointed out in other publications, you know, traditionally when the U.S. Um, or the market even established a renewables project, wind or solar, it was established with access to a baseload and generally natural gas because that's the cleanest, you know, the cleanest source. Uh, now there's this idea that somehow renewables can replace um, fossil fuels, that today's generation, when, when as we know that the, the trick is not producing a lot of energy or the challenge, the challenge is actually delivering it in a stable uh, manner and also also affordable manner, and that's where you know you need these base loads in, in electricity. We don't we don't have a substitution. Um, U.S., Europe, almost globally, everything is the policy is electrification, which flies in the face of everything we know about energy security. Why would you you know if you're supposed to diversify your fuel mixes, diversify your sources? You know what what we're saying. Let's put all of our energy use on one set of infrastructure. Um, that's at a time that when the largest states in the United States, California, New York, and Texas, um, already have systemic problems in providing electricity to their populations, and they have no no way in sight how they're gonna how they're gonna provide stable you know increases of elect electricity. Um, we've had we've had also the um, is issues like the geopolit I would call geopolitics of public. Finance. So, with with the G7 decision in December uh, 2021 to stop all public finance for fossil fuels, also also supported or or even encouraged by the Biden administration, um, while well, most of the world still wants fossil fuels, so all you're doing is handing to China on a plate and say, hey, please be the main funder for the main energy sources of most of the world, because most of the world still needs these fuels, still is going to develop them. It does nothing for climate and the environment. In fact, you can make the case that it's even worse for the environment, because of course, a, a, Chi a Chinese managed project is going to have you know, lower environmental standards than one by an American or Euro European company. Um, but all it does is give a geopolitical win um, to China. Um, we see the same thing with long-term contracts. Most of the West, especially Europe, um, has put in all sorts of legislative mechanisms that make it very difficult for companies to, to purchase long-term purchases of natural gas, whether it's American LNG or whether it's pipeline gas from places like um, the Caspian. And again, you're seeing only China benefiting from that because China is going in it, it, con um, concluding long-term contracts. In the end, Chinese companies will be selling American LNG to you know to Europe. Um, I would just say the um, <clears throat> two more points, two short points. Um, we need to really separate in our thinking the difference between renewable and green. And I, and I think a lot of our publics have have these these concepts mi mixed up. But um, renewable energy has environmental impact, just like other forms of energy. Um, and really um, to sort of ignore the environmental impact of say, especially of 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 wind. Um, it's 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 really hard to make a case that this is this is green when you see the environmental impact that the land usage. And I think publics are not going to tolerate this for much longer. Um, going back to sort of the old style geopolitics of energy and um, especially with oil, I would keep a hot spot watch on Kazakhstan. Um, Russia found the ultimate way, something better than OPEC ever dreamed of, that instead of cutting its own production to raise prices, cut that of your neighbor. Um, so that's perfect. Prices go up, you know, and you don't, and you keep, you can sell a lot of barrels. So I think we're going to see, especially as the U.S. Uh, election nears, basically Russia found for itself a tool that whenever it wants an oil spike, you know, it just cuts off Kazakhstan's export from the Black Sea. Um, something the U.S. needs to solve, and to solve that, it's going to have to have a global oil policy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Brenda. Um, Michael. All right. Great. Uh, thank you, Andrew, and thank you to the Washington Institute for including me today. Um, my remarks are going to focus more on natural gas than on oil, but I will preface my remarks by saying I still remember when I was seven, uh, going with my dad to fill up our car and also buying a lock for our gas cap in order to prevent our gasoline from being siphoned, uh, which happened once and then we got the lock and it, it didn't happen after that. 
But going back to that time period also, uh, for natural gas, and when I use the term gas, I'm going to, in case I forget the natural part, I'm going to be referring to natural gas. But if you look at the BP Statistical Review of World Energy in 1973, um, natural gas was not even included in the book. Um, it was only about oil. Um, now, if you well, now it's been given to uh, a different company. But if you look at the BP Stat Review, they not only uh, cover oil, they cover gas, they cover coal, they cover uh, uranium, they cover a whole host of other energy fuel, fuels and critical minerals. So, um, one thing to to point out, um, Bob in his remarks talked about OPEC. Um, there is a, an actual uh, natural gas. I wouldn't necessarily call it a uh, producers club, but for essentially um, you have the gas exporting countries forum, which similar to OPEC uh, at uh, pre-1972 uh, has been ineffective to date. Natural gas is much more of a regional commodity. It's, it's uh, starting to go more global, but for right now, the GECF does not have a large impact. And part of that is because of the way that natural gas is bought and sold and how it's used, and also certain ramifications that came out of 1972 and 1973, which is, you know, oil and natural gas now is predominantly controlled by national oil companies, not the Seven Sisters or other private sector companies, but the national oil companies of the of these countries. You know, um, additionally, in natural gas, as Brenda mentioned, the U.S. is the largest producer. We're also uh, the largest exporter of natural gas uh, in the world, particularly in liquefied form. But one thing to keep in mind when you're looking at the natural gas market is natural gas is very expensive to move. Um, it is not easy to move either. You know, when you think about liquefied natural gas as a form of transportation of gas, you're basically decreasing the temperature of the gas to negative 260 degrees, holding it uh, during a voyage of X thousand miles, and then regasifying it when you get to market. So that is not an easy or, or cheap way uh, to move gas. Um, going to certain similarities now of where we are today, you know, back, you know, um, you know, Bob's remarks talked about uh, the 1973 war. Well, we have a war now, and gas has figured prominently in that war between Russia and Ukraine. Um, and it, it basically showed how the industry could adapt very quickly to supplying Europe with more gas from the U.S. and from Norway and, and other suppliers. But, uh, you know, the, the it, it appears that uh, President Putin overestimated his ability to, to influence Europe, um, thinking that they would... Uh, stop their support of Ukraine because he was going to cut the gas off to Europe. Um, that has not happened. And Russia is now actually looking to reconfigure its natural gas exports to head more to Asia, uh, particularly China, um, in, 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 in how they're looking at the market. You know, as I mentioned, natural gas is becoming a much more global commodity, much more tradable commodity. And and I don't know if Bob's going to write a sequel to crude volatility and call it, you know, methane volatility or natural <laughs> gas volatility. You know, is this a good thing? And I think right now it, it, it's hard to say. Prices in the U.S., uh, even at the height of the war last year, you know, reached about eight dollars per million British thermal unit, where Europe was at eighty dollars. You know, ten times more they were paying for for their natural gas than we were. Our gas prices and European prices have dropped now much to a much more normal range. I think the U.S. last time I checked was still under three dollars uh, a million British thermal unit, and in Europe I think it was twelve dollars and Asia fourteen dollars somewhere, in, and that's a much more normal um, uh, price range. Where during the war Europe was even uh, above Asia, which tends to be the highest. Um, as I said, you know, gas is, is much more of a regional commodity. But one other thing to keep in mind is that natural gas, unlike oil, which is predominantly used in transportation, and coal, which is, is uh, predominantly used in electricity, natural gas is used in multiple, in, you know, multiple ways. As Brenda mentioned, natural gas is, is, a, is a prime fuel for electricity generation. Um, 
And that's been a lot of the focus, particularly with renewables. But natural gas is also used as a, as a um, in industrial uses, produce petrochemicals, uh, fertilizers, other things. You know, if you look around wherever you are right now, and if there's anything plastic there, it's probably come from natural gas or natural gas liquids, um, which is, which is a, a, a prime component feedstock for that. And it's used to, as a heating fuel for homes and businesses. So it's hard to think that, okay, yes, renewables may be able to re replace some of the natural gas used in electricity generation, but what are we going to use in the other, or in, in the other, product, uh, other consumption avenues of, of natural gas? And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Andrew. Okay. Um, I will turn now uh, over to my colleague, Simon, in London, but just uh, to remind our uh, viewers while we go into the discussion, if you'd like to ask uh, any questions of our panelists um, during the event, please enter them into the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, or if you're watching um, on our website or YouTube, feel free to email your questions to policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. Over to you, Simon. Yes, uh, greetings from London, uh, where I'm on a, a research trip, uh, although I'm normally based in uh, Washington. Uh, there's an obvious question to ask, which is the title of this session, and one would assume the reason why uh, we signed up to it, or people did sign up to it, was the oil weapon. What power do energy exporters wield in 2023? And the, uh, I'm guessing, probably correctly, that the people are thinking in terms of energy exporters as uh, countries like Saudi Arabia and Russia, uh, perhaps Iran, because sanctions aren't working so, uh, so well these days, and uh, Iran, if it got its act together, could produce quite a lot of oil, uh, and perhaps also Iraq. Uh, and a dimension of this, of course, is that uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia work together in OPEC plus uh, to agree on uh, export volumes or production volumes, which frankly equates through to export volumes. And so um, I suppose the question is, and I recognize that you will perhaps want to avoid being too political on this, but uh, bear with me. Uh, the question surely is um, if they play play games with oil production and uh, make it in short supply for us or uh, the prices go uh, too far up, uh, in brackets, it went down today. So uh, there's a slight contradiction there. Um, you know, what? how well are, can we cope with that impact? And um, 50 years after the shortages of 1973, are we looking good for such an impact or not? Uh, Bob, why don't you start off? Thank you, Simon. Uh, and thank you, uh, Brendan Michael, as well, for those great comments. I think you put your finger on it. So let's just step back for a second and ask ourselves, what are the instances of a producer, a major producer of oil or exporter, using oil as a weapon. In other words, deliberately uh, imposing production decisions or sanctions um, in order to make a political point, as opposed to this ancient, older motivation, just keep the price of oil stable. Uh, they can succeed or not. So there's two, there's two reasons. I think one thing you'd have to observe, there haven't been many instances in my view. Uh, and the first was the United States. We used oil as a weapon against Imperial Japan by sanctioning it, cutting them off along with a lot of other stuff, scrap metal, and, um, and backing them into a corner. And then they decide to roll the dice with Pearl Harbor. And we know how that turned out. The Arab oil embargo of 1973, although the actual cutoff in production was fairly small, and it was really an embargo on exports to Holland and the United States. So in terms of an actual disruption, it wasn't that big of a deal. The Saudis hitting 
uh, Benias and, and Tartus in Syria also disrupted some oil. But that was clearly an instance where Arab producers came together and said, we're going to make a political point here. I think you'd have to put the Saudi decision to flood the market in 1986 in there. But that wasn't to sort of uh, make a political or geopolitical point. That was to reinstill <laughs> discipline among OPEC. And then the United States returned to the oil weapon against Iran and now even Venezuela, and we're still using it. Um, in my view, uh, with those exceptions, uh, the swing producer, Texas, 32 to 72, OPEC uh, since then, OPEC plus, uh, even now in, with Russia, they are not motivated or intending or deliberately trying to use oil as a weapon. They are trying, and I say they, I mean really the Saudis because they're calling the shots. They are trying to avoid wild oil price volatility. And the risk is high because with rates at a 40-year high, inflation at a 40-year high, uh, banks falling over, all kinds of macro risks. I mean, there, there's a meaningful risk of, of what we're kind of seeing today. 10-year yields at 4.7%, uh, the price, of, the, the demand for gasoline apparently so co collapsing in the United States, the price having moved sharply, Simon, as you mentioned. So I don't think the Saudis uh, are uh, right now OPEC or OPEC plus. Uh, Putin would do something different. But even with Putin, with cutting off his banning his diesel exports, I think that's more about a domestic concern about having enough heating oil at a reasonable price in Russia for the winter. So in my view, it's rare that we see explicit use of oil as a weapon. The United States is what being one of the biggest users of the oil weapon. Um, and I don't think we're seeing it right now. Could Saudi Arabia make a mistake and deliberately over uh, or uh, inadvertently over tighten the market and bring on a sort of a demand collapse and lower prices, which is trying to avoid? Absolutely. We're all human. We could all make mistakes. But I don't think weapon is the right word to use uh, in terms of what's going on now with OPEC+. Plus. I realize that's controversial. And welcome, Simon, if you have another view. No, I, I, I'm merely the moderator. I'm trying to encourage oh. other views from <laughs> you. Uh, we'll have to have a private meeting if I'm going to tell you my views. Okay. Um, <laughs> Brenda, would you, have you got a, a couple of thoughts to add, or, or Michael as uh, well? Right. So um, I think that, yes, getting energy policy rights is essential. You can't have food security, um, uh, 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 um, uh, military power, uh, economic stability without getting energy security right. But in terms of a weapon, of, of a national security tool, foreign policy tool, I think it's it's something that you get one dance. You can do the Arab OPEC boycott, you know, once. You can do um, Russia's disruptions to European energy supplies once. You can do the current, you know, Russia's disruptions to Kazakh oil export for maybe a year. And eventually, it's it's a weapon you use once, and that and then and, and, and in all these cases, you don't get the political benefits that you wanted, and and the the sort of the uh, object of the use finds an alternative, and you lose you you know you lose market share. So if you think about um, you know what happened to the price of oil after the peak of seventy nine, you know where it was in eighty six under ten dollars a barrel. If you think of you know what how um, European markets are diversifying their energy supplies, um, and and unfortunately having also demand destruction, um, you know due to the use of the gas weapon. And I and I assume that within years Kazakhstan will diversify its oil export through. Through several, you know, through several countries, and not be completely dependent on the Black Sea ports of, of Russia. So it's it's a tool that you that a, a exporter sometimes even uses once. It's rarely effective, and in the end, they they lose uh, market share. Uh, Michael, sure, I'll just add a, a couple of things. I mean, since 1973, I think it's important to note that the financial community has created a lot of financial instruments to mitigate some of the risks that we're talking about. And some of that has spilled over onto the, the gas side, um, but it is still not as tradable as oil and doesn't, uh, doesn't benefit from the risk mitigation tools. You know, keeping in mind, and I say this as a, as a natural gas analyst for over a decade now, that I would never have expected Europe to survive as well. Um, I mean, the, the prospect that Russia was going to cut Gas to Europe, there was, you know, I would say most analysts or, uh, you know, would have said, if not all analysts, there's no way Europe could survive. Well, Europe did survive. 
and they look like you know and then even even in the midst midst of what was going on last year there was talk well this year this winter winter of 2023-24 you know that's when it's russia was really going to be able to stick it to the europeans well that doesn't seem to be the case now either and they're trying to to scramble to now find alternative uh consumers as i said uh you know they've They've signed uh, some agreements with China uh, to move more of the gas uh, east, um, and that you know again it's kind of promoting the move towards gas becoming a more tradable tradable commodity as the U.S. ramps up uh, a massive amount of potential LNG exports. Qatar is ramping is expanding their LNG. Australia, even Russia, is looking to expand its LNG exports because one of the things you know, that we've seen uh, from Europe and from the United States, they have not put the same sanctions on natural gas, um, because recognizing the importance of natural gas to the consumers, um, um, at, you know, as opposed to uh, stopping or, or sanctioning Russian exports of natural gas. If I could just add to Michael's points here that um, let's recall that the, one of the main reasons in, that Europe is weathering these gas disruptions so well is not because they're putting on more sweaters or energy efficiency, um, but it's because of demand destruction, meaning that many gas intensive industries have either collapsed or they've migrated to other places where there's cheaper energy, including uh, the United States. And those industries may never come back to Europe. And so the, so the long term, sure, their gas demand has gone down, but not because of energy efficiency, but but because of you know, the collapse of industries, and that's going to have long-term economic implications and social implications for Europe. Yeah, if I can uh, switch the subject area slightly for another uh, point. Um, I'm here in London. Uh, there's no air conditioning in London uh, that we're experiencing a, a very warm October. It's going to be... Um, 79 degrees uh, Fahrenheit here in London on Saturday, uh, which is 27 or something centigrade. Uh, I'm very conscious of the fact that uh, there are all sorts of restrictions on cars uh, here in London in terms of uh, emissions. Uh, and uh, this has uh, been a rather controversial uh, political subject and the political environment also is about uh, green as well. And this is very much in contrast to um, my sense of the way uh, the conversation in Washington works. And frankly, as uh, the comments from you uh, today have, have indicated. Um, so I want to try and press you to re-engage uh, on the green aspect of um, energy uh, exporters. Um, are they, um, what you've said so far is that uh, they're okay, they're looking forward, uh, they'll, they'll survive, et cetera, et cetera. The sentiment in Europe, uh, to put it uh, bluntly, is, uh, that, you know, the sooner they proverbially die economically, the better. Um, who's deluding who uh and is that just an economic question or could it become a international political question um what about uh brenda can i fire that one at you okay so first thing um any place where you're or most places where you're seeing sort of radical anti-fossil fuels uh policies including sort of that attempt to uh, diminish use of natural gas as well, the, the cleanness of the fossil fuels, you're seeing an emergence of a, ve of a very peculiar fuel mix, which is high on coal and high on renewables. So, so meaning almost every climate benefit you get out of renewables, you're, you're erasing with a, a increased you know, coal use. We see this in Germany, it's taking three coal fire plants, lignite coal out, you know, that were mothballed, taking them out um, for, for the winter. So you have to have a base load. It's not, it's not something that, again, the renewable energy of and today's technologies, one day there'll probably be something else, but by today's technologies, you cannot deliver stable power to to, to cities, to companies, to manufacturing without a base load. And that's gonna mean some 
compromise, let's say, with, with uh, uh, natural gas. I would say also on this sort of the arguments against the fossil fuels producers that they should become more renewable producers. I don't see any natural ability or, or advantage of fossil fuel producers to be um, producers of renewable energy. Like the fact that the word energy appears in their titles, you know, fossil fuel production is geologists, the type of laboratories they have are, you know, for, for geology, for chemistry, renewable energy is more going to be physicists, mathematicians. It's completely different set of science and scientists. And um, I, 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 I hardly will believe that most fossil fuel companies, will, they might become something else, but they won't necessarily become renewable companies. Uh, Michael. Sure. Uh, I, I, what I'd add to that is, you know, it's interesting if you go pre-COVID and some of my dates are going to be fuzzy, but, but definitely pre-COVID, you saw, I mean, and historically, there's been a synergy between natural gas and renewables, uh, which I think uh, Brenda alluded or mentioned in, in her remarks, where natural gas fired power plants were the backup for renewables when the wind didn't blow and the sun didn't shine. Um, but then if you post that, you also saw with the drop in natural gas prices in the US, all of a sudden that relationship broke. Um, and, and, and I would say it was one of the things that drove the innovation in the solar and wind industry to get their cost of production down um, because they needed to compete. They were now competing against natural gas um, and natural gas prices had dropped and they weren't looking at them necessarily as, as the complement. And so I, I think, you know, looking forward, um, you know, additional, uh, additional innovation is needed in the renewables uh, uh, sphere for production. And, you know, when, when, I, when I look at the sector, um, particularly, I don't think oil companies do certain things well, like switch to renewables. Um, I'd be very surprised if, uh, if Exxon became a renewable energy uh, company. But, uh, but that said, I think there's, there's still going to need to be innovation uh, in the renewable sector to make it more competitive, because in the end, that's what's going to win, is if they get the prices down um, and they can compete against natural gas and coal, then people will make the shift and that will make more sense. Great, thank you very much. And uh, just before I bounce it back to Andrew, who uh, will pose a few questions which he's received from uh, listeners uh, or viewers, uh, I'd very much like to get uh, the, at least the brief comment from Bob. Um, you don't look particularly worried that uh, the, the green movement uh, is going to undermine the business model of your consultancy? No, Simon, times are changing. You know, I think the biggest enemy of anyone analyzing energy policy politics is status quo bias. The idea that the future will be inexorably and inevitably what we think it is now or has been recently. And if you look at the period between the Paris Agreement 2015 and let's say the Glasgow COP in 2021, uh, there you had perhaps the high point of the sense that we're going to keep oil and gas in the ground. Uh, we're going to oil is a stranded asset. Uh, we're going to stop. LNG is as bad as, as coal and gas and oil. Uh, but, you know, that period was uh, low inflation, low interest rates. China was our friend and low kit supplier. No war with Russia. Kind of the sunniest conditions for that. And oil companies weren't even allowed in the Glasgow summit. But my how things have changed in two years. China's no longer our partner. It's our enemy. We're more interested in a, a, a non-Chinese transition, including Europe. Than a, than a quick transition with China. Interest rates are at 40-year highs. Inflation is at 40-year highs. There's a great pop, there's a war in Europe going on uh, with Russia. Everything, and oil prices are booming. Everything is completely different. In, your, in the UK, if I'm not mistaken, Prime Minister Sunak just recently walked back and delayed the car ban. Uh, he suddenly is reopening the North Sea to production after the Tories won a special election uh, on that issue. Uh, we see over and over where governments are becoming a little more pragmatic and the upcoming COP discussion is being hosted by UAE in Abu Dhabi and they're setting the discussion. And that discussion is a little more pragmatic. How, how do we decarbonize while using our oil and gas assets? So CCUS, you know, carbon capture, sequestration, 
uh, hydrogen, um, just more pragmatism. So uh, we ought not uh, imprison ourselves into thinking that the world was sort of, that the course was set in say 2020 when Joe Biden came in and signed the, the Paris Agreement and that we, our course is predetermined. Um, uh, stuff has happened uh, in history and politics uh, and market forces are, are shifting. And uh, Andrew, over to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Simon. Very good questions. Um, uh, a very quick one to Michael, perhaps. Um, you said something about, and it was actually in reference to something Brenda said earlier about you have sort of this one chance to use your boycott, as you said. Mm. And then Michael, you said that f from where you were looking at things, at least as, as I understood it, that that the Russian oil, the Russian gas weapon for tw winter 23, 24, was not going to be what we expected. But my my cousins in Germany are still stacking up wood uh, because they live next to the last nuclear power station that we shut down at Neckarvestheim. Uh, they don't understand. They they recognize that last, uh, last uh, winter and this summer uh, were incredibly mild, uh, incredibly warm. And therefore they're worried that if there's an if there's a cold winter, that we're going to be back. Uh, into this dilemma with the Russians. But you're saying that something in the markets is different now. Is it because they've adapted in time or is there something else missing? Uh, no, they, they've adapted <laughs> in the sense that they've uh, refilled their storage much quicker than uh, people anticipated. And more uh, there, there's more import capacity um, from liquefied natural gas in Germany. Um, I think they requisitioned six floating terminals in order to be ready. Um, and those right now aren't being used. They're not being utilized as much as people thought. But, but you know, I think early weather speculation, um, which to me is a uh, is is very difficult to do. Um, but it, it's showing that it may be a, a colder winter than last year, but not going to be frigid cold, um, which would bode well for for Europe. So I think the market has adapted uh, as much as it can. Um, uh, given given certain incentives, and uh, and we'll see. You know, if it's a really cold winter, then uh, yeah, you're uh, they have some troubles. But as far as you know, where things sit now, it, Europe looks like uh, it would be it'll be okay. Okay, great, thank you, Michael. So just going to some of the questions from uh, some of our um, those that are watching uh, online. So the um, Let's just stay here within the realm of gas. So one is, if we are moving from oil to LNG as the primary fuel, don't we have to look to the Gulf states' influence? Uh, is this why the Biden administration gave Qatar major non-NATO's ally status, or did it contribute to it? I'd like to tackle that. Um, uh, I'll start with that. I think that you know, sort of the energy tool goes both ways. It's not just that the supplier or the, the producer has power over markets. It's also markets um, can have power over producers. You know, they're, they're, you, you're, you can be just as dependent on, um, on the market as, as a producer, especially, you know, a country like Qatar that almost, you know, all of their production is, is, you know, is natural gas. And, and, um, you know, as as uh, Bob pointed out in his presentation, you know, sort of the oil weapon but it, it, that's been used for the last 30 years is primarily by consumers that sanction oil producers, deny market access, deny investors. So it's really gone, but you know, the opposite way. So, um, you know, so so yes, um, energy producers sort of have supersized um, power, you know, relatively maybe to their military power um, or even their overall, you know, uh, rank and GDP, but but some, but they're quite vulnerable as well. I mean, especially when you look when there's any sort of interest to change their behavior, whether it's Russia, Iraq, Iran, you have a very easy sector to target, which is their energy sector, since it's usually the predominant source of their their GDP. Okay, Michael. Uh, one thing to add, I guess, is is uh, gets at the premise of the question, which is LNG is not replacing oil. Okay, let's just be clear about that, that even though you're talking about liquefied gas, natural gas, it is not a, really a transportation fuel. Maybe in certain circumstances, it can, it can do certain things. But as I said in the beginning, oil is predominantly used in transportation, natural gas is not. Uh, it's probably the, 
the least used in, in the trans transportation sector. And to the to the other point, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what motivated the Biden administration to uh, change the the or change the status of our relationship with Qatar, but. Uh, but Qatar is a is a is a big natural gas LNG exporter and and key to keeping uh, natural gas markets supplied. So okay, thank you. All right, um, we have a question for Bob. Um, Bob mentioned diminishing spare capacity, and the chart he showed going forward is a concern. Could he talk about investments going into the upstream sector? There are many conflicting views on where it is at, notably from the I. IEA. Um, so could Bob provide perhaps some more clarity for us? I'd be happy to. I think that came from my great friend, Neil Quilliam, a brilliant it gentleman. Did. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I hope I'm outing you, Neil, but uh, thank you for that. And uh, um, so, yes. So if you, uh, you know, we can all see what's happening on the supply side. Um, before the oil bust began in 2015, right? Before Saudi Arabia said, you know, we're not gonna cut our, 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 our market share to help Russia and shale and everything. And we, we oil prices lurched from that $100 level where they've been in 2011, 12 and 13 down to, well, as low as 26 and we had negative 37 after COVID. So, so oil prices were in a bust phase in 2015 to I would say 2021. At that time, we saw upstream investment, to your question, collapse, as it always does in a bust. It was running at eight, $900 billion a year, uh, offshore, onshore, tight oil, oil, you know, shale oil, et cetera. And that got cut in half. Um, some folks think it's maybe coming back a little bit. Uh, you know, we will see. As a result of that collapse in upstream investment, and then, of course, the decline rates that we lose, you know, depending on how you measure it, four to eight percent um, of our existing crude supply a year uh, in decline. So you have to make that much new oil every year just to keep running, just to keep sort of going steady. And then to add, you need to invest more. If you look at the prevailing forecasts for sort of upstream supply as a result of this collapse of investment, these decline rates and so forth. I mean, I think most folks would say over the next 10 years, on a net basis, the world's only going to be able to increase supply by, you know, half a million barrels a day, something like that. On average, we have some more now because Saudi Arabia has some in spare, but um, it's going to get tougher in the years three, four, five. So the real question then becomes, OK, is that a problem? That's clearly a lower amount of oil supply than we're used to and that we would normally think is needed for economic growth. Well, that comes back to the big question, which is demand. Are we or are we not about to see peak oil demand in the world? The IEA is going to say, yes, we're going to see peak oil demand perhaps before 2030. Many banks and consultants and analysts think peak demand is right around the corner. Some thought it was going to peak in 2019. Um, if you believe that, then this collapse in investment and this low level of net oil supply is not a big problem. Uh, if we're only going to have demand growth of about a half a million barrels a day or more, having supply growth of about the same is a, is a balanced market. The concern is, is that if these peak demand forecasts turn out to be more wishful thinking than sound analysis, and we're much thirstier, we need well above a million barrels a day in new supply, then we have a problem because uh, we can't quickly increase investment in oil. It'll take some time. And the signal we're going to need to see are big price increases, which is what I expect. Great question. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much. And I think we're right at right at one o'clock, which is our upper limit, I believe. Um, so why don't we just, we have some other questions, but we're going to leave it there uh, for now, unless we have any objections. Uh, but I'd really like to thank uh, Bob McNally uh, for joining us from North Carolina. Um, Simon Henderson, of course, my colleague from, from London, thank you so much for working with us uh, technically to log on. Of course, here in the office, uh, my friend Brenda Schaefer and Michael Ratner. Um, it's really been a very interesting discussion. Lots more to talk about. Um, but, um, but anyways, thank you for joining us. And uh, we will find you at the next policy forum. Thank you.
Thank you very much.